Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with Jason Zweig, uh, who has probably taught me more than anyone else about the art of investing over the years uh, and, and may possibly be the best financial writer around. So thank you for joining us, Jason. Well, it's great to be with you, William, and we'll leave uh, the compliments aside, but thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to have you here. I, I wanted to start actually by asking you about your father, Irving Zweig, who died, I think, when you were about 22. This is yes. way yeah. back four decades ago in 1981. Yeah. And yeah. you've described him in the past as the, the greatest and wisest man you've ever known. And in one of your books, you, you wrote a dedication to your father, and it said, mm -hmm. for my father who knew everything. And I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about who he was, why you revered him, and, and how he influenced the person you've become. Yeah, so my dad was uh, was a remarkable guy. I mean, he was uh, he was born on a farm um, between Albany, New York, and Pittsfield, Massachusetts, um, during World War One. He had kids later in life um, because um, he served uh, three tours of duty in World War Two because the military lost his records, <laughs> um, and um, so he was a you know he was a farmer. He was a uh, political science professor. He was a newspaper publisher. Um, he became an art and antiques connoisseur. Um, and uh, he was an athlete. He, he played, he played semi-professional baseball for a couple of years. Um, he captained a boat in the Navy of the US Army during World War II because the army had a few boats and my dad, uh, my dad was in charge of a ship, a minesweeper. So he visited, uh, his tours of duty took him to South America, um, the coast of Africa, um, the Indian Ocean, the South Pacific. Um, he didn't see a lot of combat duty, but he saw enough. And um, among the many things he taught me was that there's one of his favorite expressions was there's nothing so noble or so horrible that human beings can't do to each other. <laughs> and um, he, was, he was just an extraordinary man in a lot of ways. Um, he, was, uh, he was a great storyteller too. And um, uh, he was a crusading newspaper man as well, if I remember rightly. I remember reading something you had written where he 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 almost got killed. Yeah, when that's he correct. In some story, what 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 happened there? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, in the late nineteen forties, uh, my dad was working on his PhD in political science at Ohio State when, as he put it, he got bit by the newspaper bug, and he just dropped everything and bought a newspaper. Um, on the Ohio River, right across from the West Virginia border, in what then was a very poor part of Ohio. And I, 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 I'm not familiar with the demographics today, but in those days, it was quite poor. Uh, there were numerous um, pottery factories there, because there's a lot of workable clay in, um, along the banks of the Ohio River there. And apparently, one of the one of the towns, all the workers were in the grip of a corrupt union boss who was terrorizing everyone and shaking them down for money. And uh, my dad got a bunch of tips from people in the union and um, at the next union election, wrote, he wrote a lot of editorials and a lot of investigative journalism exposing this guy as corrupt. And um, the labor union bosses, goons, came after my dad, um, slashed his tires. Um, they threatened to beat his then pregnant wife. Um, as he recalled one of them saying, um, if you don't knock off them stories, we're going to beat that baby out of your wife with a crowbar. Oh, wow. Um, and this was my dad's first wife. Um, and um, then they uh, ran him off the road on a foggy night and uh, almost crashed his car into the, down the banks of the Ohio River. But um, in the end, um, you know, journalism worked. 
justice prevailed. Um, the union boss was thrown out and a new guy came in. Um, and uh, I think my dad spent the rest of his journalism career trying to find another story as good as that one and never really did. And, you know, most journalists get a handful of great stories in a lifetime. And obviously uh, he, had, he had an amazing one, but he was an example of, of quiet courage. And I think the other story about my dad that really sticks in my memory, William, is uh, in 1981, when my dad was dying of cancer, um, I was home for a visit and the phone rang and uh, a voice said, uh, is this the Zweig residence? Very polite, formal sounding man. And I said, yes, can I help you? And he said, is Irving there? And I said, yes, but he's not really able to come to the phone. Can I take a message? And as I recall the man's name, he said, uh, well, could you tell him that Glenn Irwin is on the phone? And I knew everything about my parents' business and a lot about their life history. I had never heard of this man. And um, my dad, uh, I went and I told him, and it was, at that point, it was very difficult for my dad to move around the house um, because his lung cancer had spread to his, um, to his, uh, to his legs. Um, but he looked at me and then a light came on in his eyes and he said, oh, I'll speak to him. And he, he sort of, with a great deal of difficulty, came to the phone. And if you've ever listened to a stunning conversation that you can only hear one half of, it always sticks with you. And you know, my dad took the phone and he said, Glenn. And after a long pause, my dad said, yes, I remember. And, you know, this, the person at the other end started telling my dad a story. And my dad kept nodding and saying, yes, I, I remember. Yeah, I remember. And I saw something I had never seen. I saw my father cry. And um, I couldn't hear almost anything of what Mr. Irwin was telling him, but they talked for about 10 minutes. And at the end, my dad said, thank you very much. I hope so, which I immediately inferred. And I think correctly that my dad, that Mr. Irwin had said to my dad, I hope I will get to see you while I still can. Mm -hmm. And when he hung up, I said to my dad, who? was that? And my dad proceeded to tell me the other half of the story, which is sometime around in the late 1930s. My dad was a student at Union College in Schenectady, New York. And he was walking to class one morning and he was walking behind a student and my dad noticed he was black. And at that time he, he was either the only black student or one of maybe three black students or a handful of black students at the time. And my dad had never seen him before. And they were both walking along, minding their own business. And suddenly from behind a few trees, a bunch of white guys jumped the black student and started kicking him and, and beating him up. And my dad immediately dropped his books or whatever he was carrying and jumped in and fought back and took Glenn Irwin's side, even though he didn't know who this kid was. But it was obvious to him that, it was obvious to him who, who was right and who was wrong. And uh, momentarily the campus security people came along and broke up the fight and they all got dragged to the office of the president of the university whose name was Dixon Ryan Fox, who was a very famous uh, scholar. And of course, the white kids who had jumped Glenn Irwin all blamed him. And they said, we were walking along, minding our own business, and this N-word guy attacked us. So we had to fight back. And then this kid came along and made even more trouble. And that's what happened. And um, so 
Fox turned to my dad and Glenn Irwin and said, you know, what's your side of the story? And Glenn Irwin was so scared he couldn't speak. And my dad said, well, President Fox, maybe you remember me from when I was admitted to Union College. Because my dad had gotten uh, a rejection letter when he had initially applied that said, um, you're qualified for admission, but the Jewish quota is filled. Um, because in the 1930s, most elite educational institutions in this country had a policy that they would only admit so many Jews. And uh, the Jewish quota had been filled. And so my dad immediately um, got in his family's wagon, because in those days they, they didn't have cars, um, and uh, rode to Schenectady, which was probably about... 25 miles away, 30 miles away. And he waited outside President Fox's office all day long until his secretary said that he could go in. And he was admitted and he said to the president of the, of the college, uh, you, you sent me this letter. And it said the Jewish quota has been filled. Well, as you know, President Fox, uh, the winds of war are gathering in Europe. And young American men may be called into military service. Should I tell the US Army that the Jewish quota has been filled when I'm drafted? And so he's telling this story and President Fox says, yeah, I, I remember you young man. Why don't you tell me what really happened? And so what happened in the end was the thugs who attacked Glenn Irwin were expelled. Mm. Glenn Irwin went on, and I, if I remember right, he became something like a chemi chemical engineer and became a senior executive at, at a major company in the US. And um, what to me was so striking about this story is that my dad had never told any of us about this. My mom had never heard the story. In fact, the day it happened, my mom didn't even hear about it because all this happened between me and my dad. And um, that I think is really the definition of like quiet courage when you do something that noble and you never even talk about it and you, he completely transformed this man's life. And obviously Mr. Irwin was calling because somebody had told him Irving Zweig is very sick and they hadn't spoken in over 40 years. So. That's extraordinary. So, so is it fair to say that this kind of, um, there's a sort of moral seriousness to your journalism, I would say, where you take seriously the idea of writing about the financial world in a way where you're standing up for people, in a sense, against exploitation by Wall Street with all of its cunning, cunning ways and self-serving ways, that there is a sort of there is a sort of, um, I was going to say a subtle crusading element, but it's not so subtle. It seems to be pretty pretty central to what you do, protecting yeah. people. Yeah, well, so I want to be very careful here. I mean, I, you know, I would never liken, you know, I would never compare, you know, the daily or weekly practice of what people like me do to the kind of courage that, you know, my dad exhibited on occasions like that. But I do, I am guided by something a little different which is when I first became the mutual funds editor at Forbes magazine in 1995, Jim Michaels, the editor of the magazine, um, and of course you knew him as well, William, uh, when he gave me the job at the end of our conversation, I said to him, do you have any advice for me? Because Mutual funds editor at Forbes was actually his first job when he came to the magazine, or one of his first jobs anyway. And he thought about it for a second, and then he looked at me and he said, yeah, he said, don't get anybody's blood on your hands. And that stuck with me 
and has stayed with me ever since. I mean, you know, I think it's very important for journalists not to think of themselves as crusaders, not to become self-righteous. We're not better than the people we write about. We're not even better than the people we criticize in our writing. But we do represent our readers. And what Jim was trying to tell me is that you have to treat your reader's money as if it were your own. And you have to have that sense of responsibility where you can't recommend an investment approach or, or critique something if you wouldn't put your own money behind what you're saying. Um, and I think there is, a, there is a moral component to that because uh, you know, one expression I like to use is that you know, in the financial food chain, the individual investor is like a piece of plankton. I mean, there's sharks and barracudas and little fish and minnows and shrimp and krill. And then down below all of those is the individual investor. And it's just so easy to pander and to tell people what they want to hear. And that's not, it's not our job to tell people what they want to hear. It's our job to tell them what they need to know. When you started covering mutual funds, which I think it must have been, what, around 87, something like that, late 80s, early 90s? Well, I became the mutual funds editor at Forbes in 1992, but yeah. I had done a little bit of, uh, I, I had done a little bit of fund reporting before that. Were you... Were you startled to see the sort of things that were going on on Wall Street and, and the way that money was managed, the way that funds were sold, the self-interest, the conflicts of interest? What, what, did, what did you see that, that started to make you pretty cynical about the ways of Wall Street and to, to see, actually, instead of me just picking great fund managers and telling people, you have to invest in this now, you were kind of saying to people, you better beware because there's stuff going on here that I'm not sure you understand. Well, so I, I guess a couple of things. I mean, I had great mentors at Forbes. Um, Jim Michaels was one. Um, Bill Baldwin was another. Um, maybe even more importantly, because I worked more with them, uh, Alan Sloan, Gretchen Morganson, Alan Frank. Uh, Howard Rudnitsky, there were just incredible reporters at Forbes in those days. And um, it was a, Forbes was a journalistic culture of, of cynicism and skepticism and also a fair amount of, uh, let's say, anger. Um, People, the reporters and writers, really didn't like the way corporate America and Wall Street behaved a lot of the time. And I just sort of drank that up and, and absorbed it. And, um, you know, it's very fearless, which is yeah. unusual. For, for people who don't know Jim Michaels, Jim, Jim who, who looked a bit like um, Burns in the uh, Simpsons episode, yes. sort of Mr. Small. Mr. Burns. Small, yes. sort of satanic looking looking guy who was just so fearless and tough. Yeah. And he edited mm -hmm. the magazine for 37 years. And before I joined the magazine, I wrote a I wrote a test story exposing a guy who was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And I, I think the headline was mining the suckers because he was a mm. mining entrepreneur. And the guy didn't talk to me. And on my very first day at Forbes, when I'd been hired after this trial story, this guy, the 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 senti millionaire flies in from Singapore to tell Jim Michaels what an appalling guy I am and how I should be fired. So I literally on my first day in this job was like, I'm going to get fired on the first day. Yeah. And I remember Jim Michaels writing to me and asking me for the facts. And I, I sort of backed up various things that I'd written. And he wrote back and he said, all right, I'll just politely tell him to piss off then. And, 
it was just so phenomenal to have yeah. some, to have an editor with that courage that he was prepared to take on interests that that were powerful and could sue and I'm not sure that would happen anymore. I, I don't think there are that many magazines and newspapers that are willing to take on those powers with that kind of fearlessness because the, the business isn't so lucrative that you can survive that sort of war. That's right. Well, Forbes was Forbes and a, and a handful of other publications had the luxury then of being incredibly profitable. And I Although I don't remember the company, I distinctly remember writing a story that was so critical that the company pulled all of its ads from Forbes for the next year. Mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't tell you at this point. It was so long ago. I don't remember who it was. But, um, and I remember uh, after this happened, right after it happened, bumping into Jim, maybe in the hallway or, or someplace. Um, and he, he said, congratulations. And I said, what did I do? And he said, you got them to kill all their ads for a year. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the thought that an editor would say that to a reporter today, it's a little, is pretty far-fetched. But in those days, it was really a badge of honor. That's impressive. Yeah, I, I remember once having a story killed by a major magazine, um, really prominent magazine, um, because the company I was writing about had an ad in that issue. And mm -hmm. that, that was a, at least a decade later. And so I, I think that showed the vulnerability of these, these very powerful publications. So I think we were, uh, we were very lucky that we, we, we lived, we, we, we were we were groomed in that environment in which we just had a boss who was who was fearless and had money and power behind him. It was a yeah. it was a fantastic yeah. schooling. So years later, when when you wrote this wonderfully cynical and witty book, The Devil's Financial Dictionary, which satirizes Wall Street's way of operating, you you wrote, if I remember rightly, no matter how cynical you are about Wall Street, you aren't cynical enough. And there was a point where I, I think one of my favorite bits was when you were your definition of, of clients, uh, you, you said noun, also known on Wall Street as muppets, flunkies, chumps, suckers, marks, targets, victims, dupes, baby seals, sheep, lambs, guppies, geese, pigeons, and ducks, as in when the ducks quack, feed them. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about some of the things that made you skeptical and made you see, yeah, I've actually, I, I've got to cover the business of investing and how money is managed in a deeply skeptical and wary fashion. Yeah. So I think one, one formative experience that I can remember was, uh, and again, I mean, this was probably, I think this was before I was the mutual funds editor or maybe it was, or maybe it was right after. Um, we did something that, at the Wall Street Journal today, we would not be able to do, um, but at Forbes then it was permissible, which is I and I think another reporter um, uh, called every major brokerage firm and basically impersonated an investor um, and said, you know, I'd like to buy some mutual funds. You know, how do I go about this? You know, what's the sales commission? You know, how much is the, what, how, what will it cost me every year? You know, asking about the expenses of the fund. And um, uh, so far as I can recall, not a single one of those conversations was truthful. Um, virtually every broker we spoke to told us something that was false. And I guess I learned two things from that. Um, which one, you know, don't trust anybody. Um, but two, uh, not everybody, not everybody tells you things that are false because they're lying. A lot of people tell you things that are false because they don't know any better. The problem is from the end from the point of view of the end consumer, the individual investor, 
it almost doesn't matter. I mean, if somebody is misleading you, you don't really care whether that's intentional or not. But the conclusion I came away with is that a lot of people are either lying or ignorant um, in the community that sells investments to the public. And that view has, has never really changed. I mean, do I think that the average financial advisor is, you know, a liar or a fool? No. Um, I think most of them are, are honest people doing their best to, you know, earn a living and help the people they work for. Um, but there's still way too many of them who aren't. And, you know, woe betide the client who, you know, makes the wrong match. And even the phrase financial advisor is a little bit of a euphemism, isn't it? Of course it is. Um, you know, the big problem I have is that most financial advisors don't give financial advice. What they do is they recommend portfolios. And they're basically investment managers who aren't really qualified to manage investments, which is why they're financial advisors rather than portfolio managers working for Fidelity or another major firm. And they call what they do financial advice, but really all they're doing is recommending portfolios. And most clients need more than just portfolio recommendations. They need financial planning advice. And most financial advisors would rather run these little portfolios than give people the advice they need. You and I worked together at Money Magazine back in the late 90s for about five years, I think. Um, and um, I, I think, despite the fact that I was much younger and less experienced than you, I had the pleasure of editing your column, which must have been torture for you. And um, and my sense back then was that, that even then, you always were investing your money basically in index funds instead of trying to pick the best active mm -hmm. fund managers. And I figured that you were one of the few people who was actually in a perfect position to pick truly exceptional fund managers, that you got to interview a hell of a lot of them, both at Forbes and then at Money, and when you were guest columnist at Time and elsewhere. And I thought that was really interesting. There was something very telling to me about that, that, that despite being in a position to pick potentially winning fund managers, you chose to index. And and I I always kind of was a little bit more schizophrenic about the choice. Like I've always indexed a part of my family's savings, particularly my wife and kids' money, because I don't think they should pay for my own self-delusion. But but I've always I've always erred towards investing my own money with active fund managers, uh, at least to some extent. And I wondered if you could talk us through why you ended up being such a passionate advocate of of indexing despite the fact that you actually did have that opportunity to find exceptional fund managers, active fund managers? Yeah, so uh, at the risk of disappointing you with a simple answer, uh, I'll say that uh, I've always loved my work so much that um, I think I throw a lot of myself into it. And when I'm not on the job, I don't want to think about my job. I don't want to do my job when I'm not doing my job. And um, for example, I, I think the only movie about, I've only seen two financial movies, I think ever, uh, Wall Street and, um, and The Big Short. Um, I make a point of not watching any movie that's about finance um, because I think Wolf of Wall Street. That's that's that would complete the uh, the, the yeah the, and you and yeah. your and Boiler Room and I guess that's the 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 the, the four the four best. But um, but I haven't seen them and I don't plan on it because. Um, I don't want to think about investing when I'm not thinking about investing. So that's really the answer. Um, I, don't, I don't want a portfolio that I have to monitor when I'm not 
monitoring portfolios. I, when I'm not working, I want to be doing something else. So if you, if you were trying to beat the market, which obviously is a very difficult game, um, I'm curious how you would go about it. Because I, I think about this a lot, obviously, myself. And I often think that if I had the talent and the temperament, which I, which I most definitely don't, what I would do if I, if I was setting up as a young money manager and I, I actually really wanted to beat the market is I'd run a small portfolio with, say, 8, 10, 12 stocks. And most of the time, I'd just sit on my hands and do nothing. And then once in a while, when there was some sort of disruption in the market or in that sector, I, I'd try to load up on cheap stocks and when they were out of favor and then hold them for years. So in some ways, the type of approach that people like Joe Greenblatt or, or Nick Sleep or, or Lee Lu, I guess, have taken over the years and, and maybe focus a bit on less efficient areas like micro caps or, or spinoffs where you're more likely to find a mispriced stock. And I, I was wondering, is, is that the way to win the game or are there many ways to win the game? What, what would you do if, if despite a lifetime of preaching the virtues of indexing, you said, yeah, actually, I'm going to try to beat the market? Well, first of all, uh, I think there are many ways. Um, you know, um, Max Heine, who was uh, Michael Price's mentor at Mutual Shares, um, used to say, uh, there are many roads to Jerusalem. Um, and I think that really is true. I mean, just as the, the sort of concentrated, you know, small cap value approach that you described uh, has a lot of appeal, the opposite does too. I mean, there's tons of money managers out there who, you know, have built amazing records buying overpriced momentum stocks. So I think the key is the thing that people don't talk about very much. The key is structure. Um, a money management firm that isn't structured from the start to optimize for long-term outperformance is never going to be able to do it, never going to be able to sustain it. And one of the keys is, is having an, a mental and economic alignment between the manager and the clients. I mean, if you have the wrong clients, it doesn't matter whether you have the right portfolio. Um, if you have the wrong portfolio and the right clients, they'll be able to see it through with you. And, you know, I think when you, when I read about firms or I encounter or I talk to managers at firms that have designed the structure very deliberately, like how, do the, how are the fees set up? Um, you know, do you, will you close to new investment when assets grow beyond a certain level? Um, how do you handle redemptions? Um, you know, how often do you communicate with your clients and what do you tell them? Um, I think the firms that invest the most in that kind of design and in recognizing that successful investing is about creating a community. So the members of that community are the companies that the portfolio is invested in. Those are your investees. Um, then there's your investors, your clients, and then there's the investment manager. And you, know, you should think of those things as a triangle. And unless, um, unless it's an equilateral triangle, it's gonna, it won't be able to sustain its own weight. Because when push comes to shove and markets go haywire, one or more of the legs of that triangle will snap. And the best firms are the ones that really plan for that in advance. And if you think about the really the, the managers who've built amazing track records over, over the course of decades, like Buffett, Munger, um, like Wilmot Kidd at Central Securities, whom I wrote about uh, late last year. These are people who really have designed their business 
as if it were an investment. And that's a large part of what's enabled them to succeed. It's not so much what you invest in, it's not even so much how you invest, but it's how you, it's how you integrate that process with the business and with your clients so that it all works together and you minimize the risk. It, you're not just managing investment risk, you're also managing the business risk of people getting too enthusiastic and euphoric at the wrong time, and also people getting too pessimistic and pulling their money at the wrong time. You've, you've written before that making and keeping wealth is impossible without luck. And I, I'd say even with a lot of these great investors, the timing had to break right for them. Someone like Michael Price, who you mentioned before, I remember many years ago interviewing me and he said, look, I, I went to work with Max Heine, or Heine, I can never pronounce his name. Uh, <laughs> so I got that name wrong for 25 years and I'm yeah. sticking with it. Uh, he, um, he, said, uh, he said, look, I started with him at the bottom of the bear market in I think 73, 74. Mm -hmm. so, so I start with a guy who's a brilliant bargain hunter at the bottom of the market. He's like, how could I fail to make an unbelievable yeah. amount of money? Or you think of Peter Lynch, who had this great 13 year run and however smart he was and talented he was, maybe the smartest thing was that he got out when he was at the top. So we remember him as this kind of genius. And I wondered if you could talk about the, the element of luck versus skill. Cle clearly, these guys have to have skill. Uh, I mean, I, I remember people telling me that they had been in investment meetings with, with Peter Lynch at Fidelity, and they would say, look, I came out of the same meeting. I heard the same information from the same companies, and he made more money than I did again and again. So there was clearly something he had. And yet there is a, an amount of skill that I, uh, an amount of luck that I think we can't deny. Can, can you unpack that a little for us? Yeah, I'll try. Um, one way I like to think about it is that there's a skill to being lucky. And um, I know you've heard me tell this story before, William, and technically it has nothing to do with investment management. But, um, you know, people often ask me how I got to edit Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor. And, you know, they expect me to say, oh, you know, the publisher did a beauty contest and brought in, you know, 10 different writers and had each one write a sample chapter or they interviewed people or whatever. And it's like, no, that's not what happened at all. <laughs> what happened is this. So I had, I had read, um, I had read a book and then interviewed the author, uh, a book called The Luck Factor. Um, by a psycholo British psychologist named Richard Wiseman. Um, and he had done a sort of big nationwide survey of people's attitudes toward luck. And um, when all the surveys came back, he and his team were going through them. And there was one that really jumped out at him, which was, uh, and I'm massively paraphrasing, I'm gonna get all the details wrong, but the, the essence of it is correct. This woman had said, uh, you know, um, my husband died, my, you know, two of my kids had cancer, um, have cancer. I, I lost my job, I, I got it back, but I, I'm a very lucky person. And, and he said, I really need to interview this woman. So they brought her in and he said, you know, you described all these terrible things that happened to you. And um, yet you say you're lucky. Why do you say that? And she, she proceeds to tell him this story. And she says that after her husband died and her kids got sick, she was, you know, she felt very depressed as anybody would, and she was really struggling. And then she decided that she needed a rule. And the rule she came up with was whenever she's about to go into a room full of people, she thinks of a color. And then she goes into the room and she walks up to the first person 
who's wearing anything of that color and says, hello, my name is whatever her name was. And so she looks at Professor Wiseman and he looks at her and he says, well, what does that have to do with luck? And, he sa- and she says, I always have a date on Saturday night. <laughs> and so I had just read this and heard the story from him. And there was a huge party at uh, Time Inc where you and I, I think both were working there at the time. Um, and uh, hundreds of, of journalists were there. I forget what the occasion was. And I was talking with, as usual, my closest friends and not really socializing with the group. But before I had walked in the room, I had said to myself, and I'm not sure which color it was, but I, I'm going to say blue. I had said blue. And so I looked across the room and there was somebody I knew wearing blue. And I said to my friends, you know, excuse me, I really have to go talk to her. And uh, it was our mutual friend, Nina. Ah, and um, Nina Monk, who's a wonderful writer. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I lost her in the crowd. And I was like, Ugh. you know, I haven't talked to her in like three years or four years or something. And I was like, ah, the heck with it, forget it. And then I was like, no, I have to talk to her because she's wearing whatever color it was, blue. Um, and I found her because I was looking for the color. And we had a wonderful talk about nothing in particular and life went on and you know, I went back to work the next day, et cetera, et cetera. But it turns out a couple of days later, her book publisher takes her out to lunch to congratulate her for finishing her wonderful book on um, the merger, the takeover of Time Warner by AOL. Yeah, fools when rush in. Fools rush in. And her publisher says to you her, You were oh, working for those fools. That's correct. And her publisher says to her, Oh, Nina, um, you could help me with one thing. You know, we have this book by this guy who's dead, Benjamin Graham, I think his name is. And, you know, it still sells but it's old and we need to update it. Who do you think would be good for that? And she said my name. Now she insists to this day that she would have said my name anyway, but I'm not so sure about that. I think she might've said, well, I don't know. You know, there's like five different people you could try. You know, one of them is Jason Zweig, but instead, because I just so happened to run over to her because she was wearing the right color, she said my name. And that's why they hired me. And so the thing is, that was despite the fact that I was trying to outwork everybody else in financial journalism, despite the fact that I had all these great contacts, despite everything I threw into my job, why did I get this in honor of a lifetime? Because Nina Monk happened to be wearing a dress whose color I had thought of because I had read a book. So skill is hugely important and it matters, but much of life, maybe most of life is shaped by just these weird moments of random chance. And the more professional you are and the more intellectual effort is involved in what you do, the more vehemently you will deny the importance of luck. Um, But it affects everyone in every field. And um, uh, it's hugely important in asset management too. Even though- Jason, a few years ago, you, someone, some, I don't know if I'm speaking out of school, but someone asked you to write this book where they had these amazing photos of guys like Buffett and Munger and Howard Marks and Irving yes. Khan. And you, I think, asked the Wall Street Journal if you could do it. And they said, no. And so they said, well, so who else could do it? And you recommended me. So yeah. I ended up writing The Great Minds of Investing, which, which got me back into writing about great investors after a hiatus when I'd been working at Time as an editor. Yeah. And that book led me to write Richer, Wiser, Happier. And that book led me 
to be doing this Richer, Wiser, Happier podcast, which is why you and I are here today. So there's yeah. always this really strange sequence of events, I think. And it's you wouldn't have recommended me if you didn't think I, I would do a decent job, just as Nina wouldn't have recommended you if she didn't think you would do a decent job. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I love the fact that Howard Marks always talks about his, his, his realization that he's just a lucky, a lucky guy and that that makes him happier. And it also yeah. protects him from, from what I like to call master of the universe syndrome, where you start actually to believe that you're really good. And, and I, I do think you have to be really good, but it, it's just not enough. Yeah, it's not. And, you know, uh, I don't understand why people get so angry when um, others attribute their success to, to luck. I mean, it's, I don't find it threatening that I'm lucky. I mean, the one thing I worry about is that my luck will turn, but being lucky doesn't diminish you. It doesn't make you less skilled. It just means that on top of whatever skill you have, you've also been blessed um, either by, you know, powers above, if you believe in that, or by, you know, random coincidence, you've been blessed with luck and you know, that's a very important thing to remind yourself of. You know, the first, uh, the first conversation I ever had with Warren Buffett, um, uh, we were speaking off the record, but I think I can share this part of it. One of the question, one of the first questions I asked him is, how do you think about yourself? I mean, given all the praise that you get and the, the track record you've built up over the decades, um, this was in 2000, summer of 2003. Um, do you think you're a genius with all the people telling you you are? And he paused for a long time. And then he said, just very matter of factly, said, no, I, I think I'm lucky. And then he went into his concept of uh, the ovarian lottery, which I think is incredibly powerful. And it's also irrefutable. I mean, if, if Warren Buffett had been born in another time or a different place, he wouldn't have been Warren Buffett. Um, if he'd been born a century earlier, maybe even a decade earlier or a decade later, he wouldn't have amounted to what he ended up achieving. And if he'd been born in a different place, I mean, what if he had been born in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso? or, you know, Yangon in Myanmar. And we would never have heard of him. I remember and, him, him telling a story to Guy Spear and Monish Pavright when he had a charity lunch with them back in, I think, 2008, something like that, where he had just come back from a trip, I think, to China with Bill Gates. And he, and he, he was talking about how he had seen some guy pulling in the boats. So I think I'm remembering this correctly, or or roughly, roughly correctly enough that we can get away with it, that he'd seen this guy pulling in some boats. And he said, that guy, however smart he is, could never have done what I've done because he just wasn't, wasn't born in the same place. He didn't have, uh, at, at that time, um, Ben Graham's books weren't available in Mandarin. And so, so even, even the good fortune, not just of being born in America at that time when it was booming, but actually having access to Ben Graham was transformative. And, and, I, and I, I wonder if we could actually switch to go in greater depth about Ben Graham, because mm -hmm. he's such a, a formative figure in the history of investing. And, and I, I don't think there's anyone other than Buffett who actually knows more about him than you, because you, I think back in 2003, you edited the revised edition of The Intelligent Investor and you added a commentary and updated it. Um, you also did a really excellent book on... Um, a collection of his his other writings, yeah, um, which I liked a lot. Um, I wondered if you could talk a bit about Graham as as actually a human being, because he was such an extraordinary figure. I, I, I remember it reminded me reading your introduction in one of those books that before he even graduated from Columbia in 1914, I think he was invited to teach English, math, or philosophy at Columbia, and and I yeah. suspect he could have taught classics as well if he had wanted to. And, yeah. and so can you just tell us more about 
what a towering figure he was. And then, and then if we could talk a bit about why, why is Graham still relevant? Why, why, what should investors be learning from him now? Yeah, so Graham was, was just extraordinarily brilliant. Um, you know, one detail you, you omitted, William, was that he was, uh, he was offered those three positions on the faculty at Columbia at age 20 because he was admitted uh, when he was 16. Mm -hmm. And the other detail I love is that Graham applied to matriculate at Columbia when he was 15. And uh, Columbia, as only Columbia could, lost his application. <laughs> because otherwise, he almost certainly would have been a college freshman at age 15. Wow. Um, and, um, you know, he was such a star student that three of the university's strongest departments at the time wanted to hire him to teach um, before he even graduated. So, uh, you know, that gives you some sense of, of his brilliance. The other anecdotes I love about Graham are that uh, late in his life, after he retired, um, he was traveling, I guess, in Latin America, and he heard about this wonderful novel that was published in Spanish by an Uruguayan writer, um, his name, I think, is De Benedetto, I think. Um, and so Graham taught himself Spanish and translated the novel. Um, he, also, he, also wrote, uh, he also wrote a Broadway play that was, produ that was produced on Broadway. Um, he held several patents, including a patent for uh, an improved calculator. And um, when he was 21 or 22, he had an article on, uh, on advanced calculus published in the Journal of the American Mathematical Association. So I mean, Graham was as close to a Renaissance man as Wall Street has ever seen. And, you know, he, one of his hobbies was translating Homer into Latin and um, Virgil into Greek. <laughs> Uh, and he used to play, um, he used to play multi-language Scrabble with people when he lived in the south of France. Uh, so you could make you could make a word in whichever language you chose, and Graham would, of course, try to intersect your word with a word in whatever language he felt like. And, and something tells me he 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 won most of those games. But um, so he was extraordinarily brilliant, and I think that really helped him that really helped him as an investor. You know, one of, the, one of the most indelible memories I have as a financial reporter, and I'm not gonna name any names, but um, many years ago, probably in the 1990s, I was at the Morningstar Investment Conference in Chicago. And uh, after the day's sessions, a bunch of portfolio managers went out to dinner. And, you know, I, I tagged along and, you know, we got a private room at some restaurant in Chicago. And I would say there were probably a dozen managers around the table. And at one point there was sort of a lull in the conversation. And I said, I have a question for everybody at the table. I'm really curious. Um, and they all went silent. And it was, I had made it clear we were off the record. Um, so nobody would ever get named or anything. They, we were talking freely. And I said, I want each of you to tell me what your hobby is. And so I point to the first manager and he says, golf. And I, second manager says, golf. Third manager says, yeah, I like golf. And around the table it went. And finally, the last guy, after everyone had named golf, the last guy said, my hobby is tennis. <laughs> and so my point is that what made Graham, part of what made Graham so great was that he was multidimensional. He, most, portfolio, most professional portfolio managers are extremely dull people. Uh, they work very hard. 
they sort of do nothing but think about investing. A lot of them think about investing all day long, all night long, all weekend long. Peter Lynch used to brag about, you know, taking a briefcase of papers home and, you know, spending his weekend reading 10 Ks and 10 Qs. And I, I personally find that very credible. Um, Graham wasn't like that. You know, when Graham was still, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't a young man, but he was not an old man. When he was about 60, he quit. And he stopped running professional portfolios and he just decided he would go read books and write books and, um, and um, do the kinds of things he enjoyed. And having a multi- There was a lot of romance involved there, as well. I mean, that's, yeah, that's although that, was, that, was young, that was when he was a little younger, I think. But. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a, there's a footnote, I think, in one, in one of your books where you, you talk about, um, uh, you, you talk about um, Graham being flagrantly unfaithful to his first three wives. And, and I, I felt like yeah. there's, there's a, you know, it's, uh, there's a, there's a lot you could, uh, you could unpack from that sentence. There's a lot not uh, yeah. said in that sentence. Well, in other contexts, um, I I have called Graham the uh, Wilt Chamberlain of Wall Street. Um, oh. He, uh, yeah, he he was a big believer in um, um, free love. Let's put it that way. He, yeah. he he got around the old boy, and yet at the same time was also a kind of model of integrity when it came to the way that he treated his clients in the investment business. It's a, it's a, it's a, he's a fascinating character, right? There's a, there's a complexity and a, and a contradiction there. And I, and I suspect some of that obsession with integrity and fairness, um, and also being a teacher and sharing your wisdom was very much inherited by Buffett that, that Buffett, yeah. I mean, Buffett also cloned that structure of of the partnership yep. from um, from Graham, where, where uh, with his limited partnerships. And it's interesting when you see people like Monish Pabrai and Nick Sleep and Josh Tarasoff, all of these guys, Brian Lawrence, they all have cloned the structure basically that that Buffett um, cloned from Graham. That's fair because it aligns your interests with your shareholders' interests because you're not just gouging them and getting fees when you don't perform. Exactly. So that, that's interesting that that emphasis on integrity. I think. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's totally right, and it and it is interesting and complicated. I mean, Graham was not Graham was not the person you would want to model your. Um, you wouldn't want to take re, relationship advice from Ben Graham. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I think. Uh, all all married people or anyone anyone who has a you know partner or spouse or significant other should be very glad if their partner doesn't act like Ben Graham. However, anybody who's a client of a money management firm would want your would want your portfolio manager to act exactly like Graham. And he he succeeded in compartmentalizing that. You know, maybe it even in some odd way, maybe it helped him. Maybe being a little disorderly and breaking the rules in one part of his life helped him observe the rules in the other. Um, it's interesting to speculate about. I've never really thought about it that way. But um, of other fascinating things about Graham that I wanted to run by you. One of them, I, I, I wrote about Graham in Richard Wise are happier about his early life, um, which is kind of fascinating, like that he, he came from this prosperous family that I think imported porcelain from Europe. And, yep. and then his father died at the age of about 35. And the mother was widowed and left with three kids to bring up. Mm -hmm. And the business collapsed, and she ends up turning the, the, their home into a boarding house, which failed. Then she borrows money, gets wiped out in the panic of 1907. And then Graham grows up instead of growing up with a cook and a maid and a governess, which he'd always had when they were this prosperous family when his dad was alive sees the family actually forced to sell its possessions in a public auction and, and never really recovered from that kind of public disgrace. And yeah. then lives through World War I, the Great Depression, the crash of 29, where I think from 1929 to 32, he lost like 70% of his money. Um, yeah. And then lives through World War II. And he's from a Jewish 
family, uh, he was born Benjamin Grossman, as you know, and had come from Poland, same, same sort of area that your family and mine had come from as yep, refugee correct. Jews. And what's fascinating to me is that his entire investment credo is built on this idea of the margin of safety. Mm -hmm. And here's a guy whose youth is in a sense the epitome of chaos that that even as as a jewish guy coming from from poland um he's seen i, I mean i think his if i remember rightly i think his grandfather may have been the the chief rabbi of warsaw and so his so this is kind of fascinating to me because my background is similar and your background is similar right my family came from russia poland and ukraine your, yours, I think, came from Ukraine. I remember your, your grandfather mm -hmm. was from Ukraine. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that connection, the link between this kind of personal chaos and his sense, his sense that you have to find a way of investing that protects you against chaos. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's such, a, such a good observation, William. You know, the, the anecdote that stands out for me from... Graham's life story is when he was a very small child, this was after his dad had died, um, his mother um, uh, had to cash a check at the bank. Um, um, and I think she asked Graham to take it to the bank. And um, was it that she had to cash a check? No, she had to, she had to, I forget whether it was to cash a check or make a withdrawal, but in any case, Graham had to go to the teller and the teller said out loud, sort of to the bank floor, is Mrs. Graham good for this amount? And it just stuck with him. It was maybe $5 or something like that, which of course in those days was a lot more than it is today, but it still wasn't much. And um, I think he was, I think he was, tr Graham was traumatized by loss. And, you know, in several of his books and articles, uh, he has this expression, he says, the future is something to be guarded against. And um, I think this is the, you know, this is the biggest knock on Graham. It's the criticism so many people make of him today and have been making for 20 years. And I think it's valid. Charlie Munger makes the same point. Um, the first, you know, one of the first times I interviewed Munger, he said to me, Graham was, was afraid that the depression would repeat. And he always saw another depression around the corner and all he cared about was surviving that. And in The Intelligent Investor, he talks about the difference between protection and projection. And effectively, growth stocks, growth investors are in the projection business. They're trying to extrapolate um, a, you know, a fabulous line of growth into the future. They're projecting it. And Graham cares about protecting. He's worried about the downside. And that's because he really suffered it. And he really felt it. And, um, you know, both Buffett and Munger went through the Great Depression, but they were much younger than Graham. And they saw the country come roaring back. To Graham, you know, he had been through many more severe cycles. And, um, of course, he, you know, he was only, you know, he was a, a young adult when the Federal Reserve was created. So he had lived through the panic of 1907 when there was no lender of last resort and it wasn't clear if the financial system would survive. So he was obsessed with the downside and protecting against it. And, you know, if I were revising the book today, that would be the main issue that I would, um, I would be struggling with, which is how do we reconcile the need for protection with the importance of projection. I mean, we're, we're not investing for today, we're investing for tomorrow. And if you don't project, if all you do is protect, then how will you prosper tomorrow? And I think that's the, 
that's a valid criticism of, of Graham's approach. It, it's a profound conundrum. I, I, I remember having a revelation at one point when Howard Marks, who's great at, at um, articulating these conundrums, said um, at a certain point, risk avoidance becomes return avoidance. And, yeah. and I, I have that kind of fearfulness and anxiety about the future that I suspect to some degree is an inherited thing from our families having gone through the trauma of having fled mm -hmm. from Russia and Poland and the Holocaust and the like. Um, and I, and I don't, I, I remember talking to Chuck Acre about this at one point saying that I'm kind of a pessimist and he's like, good luck with that. Uh, you know, he was, <laughs> he was like, look, as a, as an investor in stocks, you need to be an optimist. Yeah. Do yeah. you think that's true that there is a, I mean, I see you. I see you conflicted about this as well, right? Because you've written, I think, that uncertainty is the most fundamental fact about human life and economic activity. So I think you, temperamentally, in some ways, are on my side and Ben Graham's side more than on Chuck Ackray's side, temperamentally. Yeah, I mean, uh, sure, I'm I'm a worrier, um, but you know, I also am an optimist. I mean, I've seen too many good things happen in my own life and, um, and frankly, in the world's life uh, to be a pessimist. I mean, uh, I, th I think it was, uh, uh, it was, I forget who it was, it, an Israeli prime minister, <laughs> naturally, um, said, uh, um, to be a realist, you have to believe in miracles. Um, I think it was, it might've been Ben Gurion. Yeah. Either and, Ben Gurion or Golda Meir, one of those two. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's kind of true. I mean, you think back, uh, a decade ago, you know, who would have expected, well, a little more than a decade, but who would have expected, you know, cloud computing and fracking, um, you know, the U S is energy independent. Uh, that seemed impossible 15 years ago. Uh, and, you know, progress doesn't stop. Uh, as negative and horrible as a lot of the headlines are, and as worried as I am, as I think any thinking person has to be about the polarization in our society and the, and the rising uh, resentment and distrust of expertise and the anger across the political spectrum at the other side. Um, I, I just, I don't know how, I don't know how you can really be a pessimist. Yeah, I, I tend to feel, have, having talked to a lot of great investors who are smarter about this stuff than I am, that it's a kind of general upward trajectory that's interrupted by these periods of tremendous disruption, but that, I think that that's that was Ray Dalio's view when I interviewed him mm -hmm. recently. There's mm -hmm. a, a that if you look at the very long term picture of productivity, longevity, you know, human lifespan, um, quality of life, it's hard not to be optimistic. But there are these periods of disruption, and and so it seems to me that part of the key to investing well is is to set yourself up for survival. And I I, I remember you having a great a great interview with Peter Bernstein, where he talked about just this recognition um, of just how badly things can get wrong. When you asked him about the, the biggest mistake that you can yeah. make in investing, what, can, can, I'm misremembering it somewhat. Can, can, you, can, can you talk about what you learned from that? Yeah, I mean, what Peter said was that uh, survival is the, I think he said survival is the only path to wealth. Um, and, for anybody who doesn't know, I mean, Peter was just this extraordinary figure. I mean, he was over, over 90 when he died. He worked on Wall Street for over 60 years. Um, he was an economist, a portfolio manager, and, and probably the, the most sophisticated observer of the investment management business I've ever come across. And, and, and wrote a beautiful book called Against the Gods, A History yeah. of Risk, which is one, yeah. one of the great books, which I somehow, I, I realized I have a, a signed copy that he's inscribed to me. And I have no recollection at all of whether he gave it to me. Uh, this, is, this is the joy of middle age, is that I truly uh, can't remember yeah. if I even met him. Um, yeah, well, you have to hang on to that. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it, it's really true because the thing is, if you, and, and I think, 
Peter is giving us the bridge that sort of solves this conundrum that you raised with Graham, the bridge between protection and projection, right? Which is if all you do is project, you may well not survive. And if all you do is protect, then you may not have enough growth to really thrive over the long term. So you need to do both. You need to protect, you need to protect your downside, you need to have that margin of safety, but you also have to ensure that you haven't truncated your upside too much. And you know, that's Graham got out of the market in, you know, I don't know, the late 1960s or something and never really got back in. And, um, you know, he was probably more, a lot more conservative than he needed to be. On the other hand, once you have, you know, there's that wonderful expression, uh, you know, once you win the game, stop playing. Um, you know, he had all the money he needed or wanted. So what would he put it at risk for? You know, um, one of the, I think the, the single most important principle any of us can take from Graham's emphasis on protection is, you know, don't take a risk you don't need to take. I mean, that's true if you're a professional portfolio manager, it's true if you're just an individual investor. Um, you should take intelligent risks, which means they are risks you need to take and you understand. Yeah, it, it seems to me that focus on just catastrophe avoidance is so central, just constantly asking yourself, what, what's the consequence if I'm wrong? Yep. yep. And that was something Bernstein talked about a lot as well, right? That it was, yeah. it was consequences. Is... He said something about consequences matter much more than probabilities. Yeah. So this is, uh... I mean, Peter was a huge fan of Pascal's wager. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, um, you know, the great theolo theologian and, and philosopher uh, Pascal um, proposed this thought experiment, which has become known as Pascal's wager. And the basic idea is, you know, either God exists or he doesn't. Um, you have a choice between living an ethical life or not. And if you, live, uh, if you live an immoral life, you'll have a lot of fun while you're doing it. Um, uh, and if you live a moral life, it probably won't be as much fun while you're living it. Um, so you're basically wagering, is there, does God exist or doesn't he? And um, if God exists, then you don't lose anything as the person who lived the moral life, but the immoral person is in a lot of trouble. And so Peter really emphasized framing things in terms of Pascal's wager, which is not so much the way most people think when they invest. Most people think, how much am I gonna make if I'm right? But Peter's point is you also need to ask, how much am I gonna lose if I'm wrong? And it hurts a lot more to be wrong than it feels good to be right. And being wrong once, if you're too wrong, can take you out of the game permanently. I mean, if you get wiped out, you're done. And, and you've said that, uh, I think the phrase you used at one point was that a diversified portfolio is the closest thing to a sure thing in all of finance. That, that, that ultimately, the, the best insurance policy, other than not investing, uh, which which doesn't lead to a great uh, outcome either with inflation and the like. Um, that that the best insurance policy is to diversify. Is that is that also one of the one of just the most simple and basic but timeless lessons that we get from someone like Graham, who who was probably much more diversified than Buffett. Yeah. Chose yeah. To. Yeah. Correct. I mean, it's kind of interesting. This is another area where Buffett and Munger really diverge from Graham. Graham, Graham um, invested in categories of securities. You know, if railroad stocks were cheap, he would just buy every railroad stock that was cheap. Um, he wouldn't buy one, he would buy dozens. Um, if he thought utilities were cheap, he would buy every utility he could find that was cheap. 
Uh, he was a, Graham was a huge believer in diversification and Buffett and Munger are not. And, you know, I think the right way to think about it is that diversification is inverse to the likelihood that you have superior knowledge and you're actually right. So the more sure you are that you know what you're doing, that you're doing something that not everybody else is, and that there's an asymmetry between the downside and the upside, the more you should put in that asset. Um, and, you know, uh, great investors will tend to be under diversified, great active investors, because they feel or their experience tells them that they should concentrate. The problem with that is that people aren't very good at assessing how valid their signals of confidence are. And, you know, it's, nor it's part of normal human behavior to be overconfident. And if you're overconfident about the things you're overconcentrating in, um, the result is not likely to be, <laughs> be very um, accretive in the long run. Yeah, I, I, I remember once saying to Bill Miller when he was, I think he had bought 15% of Amazon. This is back in 2000, 2001, and everything was going to hell in the market after 9-11. And he was, I was with him while he was investing hundreds of millions of dollars. And I said to him at one point, God, you got to have so much balls to do what you do. And he said, yeah, I've also got to be right. And yeah. it was one of those moments where you were like, oh, yeah. It's like so many of the, the, the truths that you hear in investing are so simple you know, this, this emphasis on survival, this emphasis on diversification, this emphasis on being right, that, like th this emphasis on being long-term and patient, they're all so platitudinous that our eyes kind of glaze over and, and we don't take them seriously. But it's, yeah, if you're going to, if you're going to, if, if you're going to concentrate really heavily in a few positions, you better be really smart and right. Yeah. And, and William, and it's, it, and it, and it's worth, it's worth emphasizing for people the sequel, right? Mm. Because Bill was almost looking forward in a way. He was almost looking ahead because he did the same thing seven or eight years later with financials and he wasn't right. And then the sequel to the sequel, which is then he did the same thing with Bitcoin and, yes, and Amazon. Yes, and he was and, right. And was right. So exactly. I, I think to some extent, when I look at these great investors, I, I was thinking about this recently with Bill Ackman as well, where I, I was reading in the journal the other day about how he just made $4 billion during the financial mm -hmm. crisis, yeah. uh, sorry, during the, uh, the, the COVID meltdown and then the recovery. I was just thinking one of the keys is just to be true to themselves. Like you, you have to kind of embrace your own form of craziness to some extent to be extraordinary at anything. You, 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 have, to, you have to play the game in a way that suits your particular form of brilliance and craziness. Does, does, that, does that resonate for you? Yeah, it does. And I think, you know, I think the challenge all great professionals face is, is this push and pull between the sense you have that you are exerting actual skill and the need for humility. I mean, you know, whenever I hear anyone talk about being humble, I just, I mean, I want to throw up. I mean, it's like, if you're talking about your own humility, then you don't have any. <laughs> I, I literally, I, Jason, had a conversation a few years ago where I was talking with a guy I was friends with who I was helping with a, a memoir that hasn't been published, who's a multi, multi-billionaire um, art collector. And I was talking about, you know, someone had said something about, uh, humility and vanity and the like. And he said, no one is more humble than I am. And, and I sort of burst out laughing and I thought, I thought he was joking. And then I realized, no, no, he's totally serious. Yeah, Here is this yeah. multi-billionaire saying, nobody is more humble than I am. Right. Boasting yeah, about I'm his not. humility. It was yeah. just wonderful. Right. I'm the best at being humble. You know, yeah. Look at me. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, a, it, it's, I think the key is the key is that combination of you, you can't be good at something if you don't think you're good at it. 
Um, and if you've been a professional investor for years and you have a successful track record, it's sort of inconceivable that you would, you don't come into the office each day and saying, oh God, what am I gonna screw up next? Um, you come in, you, you, you have a sense of exerting your skill and, and demonstrating your power uh, and your facility and your knowledge. And without that, you'd be lost. On the other hand, you can't let it go to your head. And, you know, there's ultimately, I think, humility, the only way to resolve it is with paradox, right? I mean, there's a wonderful expression, I think it's somewhere in the Talmud, actually, that says um, the, tr the truly healthy man has a soul without knowing it. Hmm. And it, it's something like that. It's, it's that, it's that you, you want to be humble and you seek to be humble, but you don't really expect to achieve it. Because if you did, um, if you did expect it, you would end up sounding like the person you were just describing. To, to go back a bit to what we were talking about before with Buffett, um, Buffett obviously um, learned immensely from Graham and Graham had a profound impact on him. But in many ways, um, the student far surpassed the teacher. Buffett has become a much greater investor, I suspect, um, certainly a much, a much richer investor. You, you've interviewed Buffett multiple times and I, I I wondered, A, if you could give us a sense of what that experience was like for you, what you took away from it, but also if you could talk to us about um, Buffett's emotional makeup, which seems absolutely critical because it seems to me that he, 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 he does have an emotional or temperamental advantage over Graham. Um, and I remember you once saying to me that, that you regarded Buffett as inversely emotional, if I'm correcting mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Uh, if, yeah. Sorry, if I'm quoting you correctly. Yeah. Um, could, could you talk about that a, a little bit? Yeah, so uh, the first time I ever met Buffett, which I, as I think I mentioned earlier, was in uh, July, 2003. Uh, what really struck me about him was his warmth and empathy and it really it really feels as if you're the only person he he wants to talk to um, he is incredibly good at focusing his attention on you as a person and um you know, he asked me at least as many questions about myself as I asked him. And um, very interesting questions. Um, and when I later learned more about his background and development as a person, I realized that that came to him after decades of relentless, what must have been brutal effort. Um, because if you, if you read the Alice Schroeder biography of Buffett, he was so shy when he was young that he was almost literally socially paralyzed. He couldn't speak to people. And um, so he, he, through Dale Carnegie courses, through just discipline and effort, he remade himself into the kind of person he wanted to be. And how many people do any of us know who have completed a self-transformation like that? It's almost, it's almost like someone who, uh, I know most alcoholics would never use this term, it's almost like someone who's a, who's a recovered alcoholic. Um, he, he didn't want to be the person he had been, and he became somebody entirely different. And I think he's applied that kind of emotional discipline and like steely power to his day job 
as well in a way that most of us probably aren't capable of doing. You know, uh, every investor I've ever met, if you say to them, you know, will you buy more stocks if the stock market goes down 10%? I've never met anybody who would say, no, I wouldn't do that. But, <laughs> but when the stock market goes down 10%, it's gone down 10% because a lot of people were selling. So, I mean, what does that tell you? And when, when the stock market goes down 10%, Buffett sits up and he starts looking because he says, oh, this is getting interesting. And um, the more it goes down, the more interested he gets. And that's, that's why I use that term inversely emotional. Um, uh, and when I've discussed it with him, he, he says, yes, that's correct. Um, I, use other, I, I use other people's emotion as a cue for my own. And when other people are enthusiastic, I become pessimistic. And when they're negative, I become positive. When, when you wrote your book, Your Money and Your Mind, which I think came out in 2007, which was one yeah. of the first books about neuroeconomics. Yeah, and Your Money and Your Brain. Yeah. So, sorry, Your Money and Your Brain. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, and you were showing how our, how our brains mess up, as I just did. Um, particularly when we're making decisions around money. And I, I remember I was, I was rereading it the other day and, and I, I'm having to say, I still have a, a, the advanced copy from before it came out that you gave me all, all yeah. those years ago. Um, yeah. and, and you were talking about how when you're making money in the market, for example, it, it, it's, it's like being high on cocaine, that it has basically the same neural effect. And, and, as part of your research, I remember you had your brain scanned in various MRI machines and, and you took part in various experiments in different research laboratories. And I'm wondering what you learned about your own brain that surprised you, that made you think, uh, yeah, I'm not Buffett, I'm not Munger, I'm not unemotional, or these are the forces that are, that are unconsciously driving my decisions that I wasn't even aware were driving my decisions. Yeah, so... Uh... You know, I think the most remarkable experiment I participated in was uh, at Emory University. And um, it, it's a little, it, it, I think it's a little too complicated to describe here, but to boil it down to the essence, what was astounding to me is I was, I was presented with a problem, a, like a choice problem, sort of A or B. Um, and there was reward associated with the choices. Um, and I was in the MRI scanner trying to solve these problems while my brain was being scanned. And my conscious mind was working like crazy, trying to figure out what to do. And while I was deliberating what the optimal choice was, my right hand, which was hovering over the button press that you use to record your responses inside an MRI machine, my right index finger was going ding, 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 because my unconscious mind had figured out the answer. Even as, you know, the sort of prefrontal cortex of me was totally flummoxed by the problem. The unconscious mind, the one that had gotten the reward was like, oh, the reward is over here. Stop mm -hmm. thinking and go get the sugar water because that was the reward. It was basically like, you know, a sweet drink that they were piping into my mouth. And I remember flying home on the plane, looking out the window and just saying, oh, what the happened to me? <laughs> and you know, it, it, it's really humbling when you discover that, you know, there's this sort of subterranean creature living in your head, doing all this stuff, and you have no awareness that it's going on. And, and frankly, you never will unless you're exposed to, you know, those kinds of conditions, which are obviously extraordinarily rare. So given, given that our emotional reactions are kind of crazy and, and that we're driven nuts by things like the thrill of gain or our 
fear of the pain of loss or the cravings for whatever feels likely to be rewarding in the short term. What, what can we actually do in practical terms to protect ourselves? Like, what, are there procedures that, that you would recommend or that you put in place yourself after discovering that you were a little nuttier and more emotional and driven more by your subconscious mind than you thought? What, what can we actually do? Yeah, so um, as, uh, as I know you're aware, William, because you helped him do it, um, you know, Guy Spear has written a lot about the importance of, I, I'm going to call it investing hygiene. Mm. And, you know, that term, uh, the term hygiene comes up a lot. Danny Kahneman uses it in his new book, Noise. He uses the expression decision hygiene. Um, it's a term I love. And I think that's the key. You know, one of the phrases I like that I, I've often used um, when I talk with fund managers and, and in institutional investors is, you know, anything that can be made a matter of policy and procedure should be made into a policy and procedure. The idea is you want to take your subjective judgment out of the process, out of the decision process as often and as thoroughly as you can. You don't want to remove it completely um, because you're not a machine and you haven't been hired to be one, but wherever it isn't essential, you want to get rid of it. And so you want rules and policies and procedures, and you want a lot of if then statements in your investment process. If, the, if this stock goes down 25%, then if I own it, I must then reevaluate it to see if I should be buying more and averaging down or whether something fundamental about the company has changed and I should sell. If I don't yet own it, then because it's on my watch list, I should be evaluating it as a purchase because it's just gotten a lot cheaper. And everything should be an if-then statement that can be an if-then statement. And the more rules and policies and procedures you have, the more checklists and watch lists you can build into your process, um, the better your hygiene is. And then of course, the other key, which you know, which Guy Spear has written about and you've written about extensively is um, it's not just what you do, but it's where and how you do it. Uh, Sir John Templeton managed money from Lifer Key. Um, Buffett manages money from Omaha. You don't have to work on Wall Street or in Manhattan or on, you know, Bay Street in Toronto or, you know, uh, in the London you know, financial center or Hong Kong or whatever. Um, it could be very constructive for you to be doing what you're doing in the middle of nowhere where you don't have those influences. And um, anything you can do to break the usual pattern of reaction and response and, um, and hot emotion can be really powerful. Yeah, one, one thing that w you helped to clarify for me in the last week when I was rereading re all of your books in an insanely obsessive way uh, to prepare for this, you there's a beautiful definition in the Devil's Financial Dictionary, which is, for, for people who don't know, a kind of satirical um, book of definitions um, that show the, uh, the the distortions and hypocrisy and uh, and spin uh, on on Wall Street. And there's a there's a definition of self control as the secret to success as an investor, and you and you write I think this was in that book within you lurk an angel a devil a scholar and an idiot if the angel and the scholar ever let down their guard the devil and the idiot will wreak havoc that will take years of work to undo those investors who control their own behavior and abandon the futile effort to control the markets around them are the only ones who will ultimately prevail. And it, and it really struck me, I mean, A, it's a beautiful piece of writing and reminded me, um, without trying to be obsequious of what, a, what a, a, a gifted writer you are, 
but B, it's, it's, it's really clarifying to come back to the realization that this is something from Ben Graham as well, right? This idea that, that you're your own worst enemy and that the real game at the heart of investing is what you call the, the, the struggle for self-control. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for the, thanks for the kind words, William. Um, and I think we should tell our audience that over the years, you haven't just edited me, but I've also edited you and, huh. and taken great pleasure um, regardless of which side of the red pen I was on. So, um, but uh, yeah, you know, um, I think one thing that is important for everyone to think about is that investing is a head game, um, but isn't everything? I mean, when you watch two of the world's greatest tennis players hammering the ball at each other across the net, who's going to win? The one who's bigger, stronger, faster, um, maybe? Or is it going to be the one who stays focused and who doesn't let his or her own mistakes ruin the match. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a very poor recreational tennis player. And um, one of the reasons I, I sort of stopped doing it was I found I would get so frustrated at my own mistakes that I couldn't calm myself back down. And, you know, there's a useful lesson in that, which is that skill in one domain doesn't really you know, carry over to every other. I think I'm very good at, at managing my, my investment emotions, but I'm really bad at managing my tennis emotions. Mm. Um, but look, investing is above all else a head game because everyone we're competing with in the financial markets has pretty much the same resources at their disposal. Um, you know, after Reg FD in the United States, you know, no analyst really gets some inside scoop before some other analyst. Um, everybody has a Bloomberg machine. Everybody reads the Wall Street Journal. Um, stock quotes are instantaneous. There's, you know, 100, whatever it is, 180,000 CFAs around the world. Um, you know, it's an unbelievably competitive marketplace. So what would distinguish the greats from the very goods. It kind of has to be something they're bringing in from outside, which is their own character. And, you know, you, if you want to be great, you're going to have to put as much effort into cultivating your character as you do into managing your portfolio. You spent a couple of years helping Danny Kahneman, the Nobel laureate who you mentioned before, when he was first working on his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And obviously Kahneman is one of the great experts on biases and the way that we sabotage ourselves when making decisions. And I was wondering, having seen him up close, how, how rational was he? Because my guess is he was, you know, he's a brilliant, but not an easy man. And I, uh, maybe, maybe that's unfair, but I, I was wondering, A, what the experience was like of working with him and B, whether, whether you learned anything from him that's really changed the way you operate in the world? Yeah, so um, the first day we officially started working together, um, Danny did something amazing, which is he, he, did the, um, he did the sort of the planning fallacy um, exercise with me. So the planning fallacy for anybody who doesn't know is that when people commence uh, large or complicated projects and estimate how long and how difficult they will be, they look at the inside information that's available to them. Like who's, who are we, who, you know, who's doing this? What are we trying to do? Um, what resources do we have available? Uh, uh, how good are we? 
And that's the inside view. And the outside view is who else has tried stuff like this? And how hard was it for them? And how long did it take them? And so Danny sat me down and we did a planning fallacy exercise. And he's like, so how long does it typically take people to do a book? Um, and eventually we got into the kinds of details like, you know, how many words a day is it realistic to write? And um, how many days in a row can people write? And so we went through all this and, and, and he, he was very open and very adamant. He said, you know, I'm doing this because I want us both to be realistic about what we're getting in for. And because I know that if we don't do this, we'll be absurdly over-optimistic. And so at the end of the exercise, after he had grilled me for, I don't know, it was probably over an hour, um, we sort of mutually decided uh, it should take a year and a half. It might take two. And so that would have been uh, 2007. And the book came out in 2011, but he almost quit about 20 times. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we missed. Uh, we underestimated by at least half. Um, and, um, uh, but that, 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 is the, that is the remarkable characteristic that Danny has, which is that he, he approaches everything uh, with a clean slate and he doesn't take anything for granted. And I remember at one point we were just making small talk about something and my kids were very young at that point. And I said something along the lines, it, it was true small talk, just filling the, filling the empty time. I said something like, oh, you know, my wife and I were, were kind of, you know, sort of strict parents. And he turned to me and said, why? And I suddenly realized I didn't know. <laughs> And I was like, you know, why do we do that? I don't know. And, and, uh, and another time we were walking along the street and someone came by sort of gushing over their dog, you know, like the dog was on the leash and the person was sort of goo 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 talking to the dog. And Danny said, that's something I know nothing about. Why do people do that? <laughs> Oh. I said, oh, dogs are wonderful, Danny. And he said, no, but why do, why do people love dogs as much as they love people? And, and that ability to look at the world as if you've never seen it before is really extraordinary. And to like take every sort of, take every fact that's presented to you and just treat it as some kind of alien object that you know nothing about. That was the, he gave me many gifts when, when we worked together, but I think that was the, that was the greatest along with um, letting go of sunk costs, which I think is so important. And he, he really taught me that. Which is, which you apply how? Well, so the, uh, so we had worked very hard on a chapter of the book, um, which I'm not sure at this point which one it was. I'm going to say it was probably the chapter about Paul Neal's research. Paul Neal was one of the great psychologists of the 20th century and, and a hero of Danny's. And uh, we had worked on this chapter for weeks. And... Um, uh, and we finished it and it was beautiful. And I, I went to bed that night feeling very pleased at, at what we had accomplished. And I woke up the next morning and I had all these Danny Grams in my mailbox. And anybody who knows Danny Kahneman well talks about Danny Grams, which are these emails that he starts sending around two or three in the morning um, and are incredibly dire and pessimistic and they just keep getting darker and i think the first one started out the subject line was something like this will not do and then it became 
and this is terrible. And then it became, the subject lines became things like horrible, I am ashamed, <laughs> um, uh, this is ridiculous. Um, and then I think there was one that said disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I'm, I'm reading these and I'm, my, I'm sweating, I'm, my forehead is dripping sweat, my palms are, my palms are sweating, I'm feeling as if, feeling nauseous. And then maybe around eight in the morning comes an email and it says, I think I can fix it. And uh, Danny is not much of a sleeper. And when he wakes up in the middle of the night, he just gets up and does this. And um, by the end of the day, he, he had completely rewritten the entire chapter. It was, it was as if it had been written by another person, hmm. almost a person from another planet. The tone was different. The substance was different. The organization was different. The materials he used to make the points were all different. And it was, and it was great. And the next morning, I went down to his apartment as, 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 we, as I did every day at that point. And I walked in the door and I said to him, Danny, how did you do that? How? <laughs> and he just turned to me, he was making coffee and he turned to me and he said, I have no sunk costs. And that was just his way of saying that, you know, if it didn't work, try something else and see if that'll work. And um, for a writer, and I think for anybody who makes decisions, of any kind, that's a very valuable lesson. I mean, you can't let go of everything you do and start from scratch, but whenever something isn't working beautifully, then you should smash it and start over and see if you can make it work beautifully. I, I asked last week for people to submit questions on Twitter that I thought they might like me to ask you. and. Um, and I, I've pledged that if I use a particular question with each with each interview I do on this podcast, I'm, I'm actually going to send them a, a signed copy of um, my book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, which I'm, unfortunately this one I have to send to Spain, which knowing UPS will cost me about $200. Um, there's a, uh, an Israeli guy called Alon Mi, Michael, I think, or Michael, I don't know, who, who lives in Madrid, uh, who who asked me to ask you, what, what biases your especially vulnerable to that prevent you thinking rationally? What have you had to work hardest to root out? And what did you do in practical terms to overcome it? Yeah, well, for me, um, and thanks for the question, Alon, and enjoy the book. Um, it's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think there's any doubt in my own mind which bias has been most harmful and difficult and difficult for me to overcome. Although, of course, I could be wrong. Uh, but for me, it would be overconfidence. Um, you know, I, I, a few years ago, I wrote an essay called Overconfidence, an autobiography, um, in which I told a story about uh, my first week in college, um, in which I made a total complete idiot out of myself in front of all my classmates. Um, without understanding that's what I was about to do. And it's a moment uh, uh, that has lived with me ever since, and I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the beauties of working at the Wall Street Journal and having, you know, hundreds of thousands, in fact, I guess millions uh, of readers, is you can't really make a mistake and get away with it. Um, it's uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, within about 30 seconds of when a column of mine is published that has an error in it, um, the emails start to come in. Um, and that does keep me honest. And um, uh, making mistakes is not enough to keep you from being overconfident. What helps is making mistakes and 
learning that you made them. And um, I'm very fortunate that I have an audience that will immediately let me know if anything I say isn't accurate. Uh, and uh, it also helps. Uh, it also helps to be married or to be in a long-term relationship with somebody. I don't know if you if you know the wonderful line from H. L. Mencken, William. Uh, Mencken was a was a great American journalist uh, in the early part of the 20th century, and I love uh, one of his expressions that a man a man may be a fool and not know it, but not if he is married. <laughs> ah. I was so lazy yesterday that I, I saw a footnote in one of your, in, in, in something that you had written that quoted Mencken's Christomopathy or however you- Yes, Christomopathy, yeah. And I know that I have it in my house. And instead of go look for it, which is a really hard thing to do because I have thousands of books, I just ordered another copy. It was oh. a terrible, a terrible act of laziness. Oh, that's it was a, bad. There was a beautiful thing in in that essay that you wrote about your um, your autobiography of your overconfidence, where I, I think, if I remember rightly, you said something about how how you were the the um, the most dangerous of all people, the the fool who thought he was a genius. And it seems like that's something that that you've worked on a great deal over the years, whether it's learning mm -hmm. from Peter Bernstein or from your father or others. Just the importance of um, of realizing how little we know that that that, 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 that again these things are kind of platitudinous but really profound that that you you spent the last sixty years reading obsessively and yet yeah. you discover actually ah, I can't I still can't predict anything about the future for example yeah yeah I mean you know I had I had both the incredible good fortune and the misfortune of growing up in a very unusual way. So, um, you know, I, I grew up on a farm uh, at the end of a dirt road, 12 miles from the nearest stoplight in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, I was far and away the best student in my teeny class um, uh, and probably the entire school. And so by the time I was 18, I thought I was brilliant um, because I guess by comparison, uh, at least academic comparison, um, that's what the numbers were telling me, right? Um, and then of course I got to college and found out that everybody else was brilliant too. <laughs> And suddenly I wasn't a, suddenly I wasn't valedictorian of a class of 31 students because five of them had dropped out over the course of my senior year in high school. Um, I was near the bottom of my class. Um, and that was a really powerful lesson to me. Um, and you know, the other difficulty you run into is when you do anything for a long time, you eventually learn stuff. And um, the real danger for a journalist, and I think for investment managers as well, or any kind of investor, is, um, is thinking you know all the answers um, and eventually running out of questions. Um, so that's what I thought, the longer I do this, the harder I work at making sure I don't run out of questions and trying to um, keep digging into things I don't know enough about or things I know nothing about um, to keep myself hungry so that I don't that's that's another way I think you can try to keep your head from swelling. You know, you've you've talked a lot about learning from your own mistakes and other people's mistakes, and the importance also of learning from historical mistakes. And 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 one of the things that I've been tearing my hair out, what, what little is left of it lately, is <laughs> is a sorry I uh, yeah, to bring up that yeah. sensitive subject, Jason, yeah. um, is for for people like us who tend to be fairly skeptical of 
crowd euphoria, at times when people get carried away. You look at things like the speculative excitement surrounding stuff like the ARC Fund, um, Kathy, uh, um, Kathy, Wood. Kathy Wood and uh, Tesla soaring or cryptocurrencies going wild. Yeah. And my instinct is always to look at those things and say, okay, so it's just a repeat of the euphoria of 1928 or 1972 or 2000 or, and, and, and yet I also have to be aware that I actually, I don't know that I don't know very much. I don't really understand technology very well. And maybe something really profound has truly changed and that there are these disruptive technologies that we should be profiting from rather than just saying like Templeton, that the foremost expensive words in the English language uh, this time is different. And I'm wondering how you think about these, this sort of latest um, manifestation of, of new paradigmism, new euphoria. Uh, do, do you, what do you, what do you think? Is it, is it the real deal? Is it something to be aware of? Is it, how, how do you think of it? Well, I guess I would, I guess I would say that um, I'm sort of quoting myself from the column that I did today. I mean, you can be right about the future and be wrong about how to profit from it. Um, you know, think back to the fourth quarter of 1999 or the first couple months of 2000. Um, if you believed as an investor that the internet was going to change the world and that it was going to be the biggest fundamental shift in how the economy worked in at least a generation, you would have been absolutely right. But that doesn't mean you should have gone out and bought Yahoo and Cisco and WorldCom and Global Crossing at hundreds of times earnings. Uh, the question isn't whether a technology is disruptive because new technologies come along all the time and a lot of them are disruptive. Uh, the question is whether it's disruptive and priced appropriately. And, you know, a lot of the estimates of, you know, the future market for various disruptive technologies are very aggressive. Uh, you know, back in the late 90s, people were making estimates for the growth of the internet that were ridiculous, which is why every internet stock traded at bubble valuations. And if you had bought only Amazon and maybe a couple others, maybe, maybe eBay, you, uh, you would have, um, uh, you would have done very well. But if you had bought all of them, uh, you would have done terribly. Um, and um, if you had bought indiscriminately, you would have lost almost all your money. So that's the real question. And then I think there's another, there's another element that people are missing, which is that disruptive technologies don't just disrupt the entrenched technologies, they disrupt themselves. Um, you know, it's entirely possible that what we'll see in crypto is this kind of massive, you know, uh, endless cannibalization where, you know, new coins arise constantly and push the earlier coins aside. And one, one element that I do think a lot of younger investors don't fully appreciate is that entire markets can disappear. You know, and this is one reason Graham was pessimistic. And I don't think he was wrong in this respect. I mean, just because there's been a deep liquid active market for an asset for a long time doesn't mean there always will be. Because if the world changes and it moves away from that asset, the market for the asset and the asset itself will basically disappear. I mean, after my parents were in the newspaper business, they became art and antique dealers and they specialized in 18th century American furniture. Um, uh, and uh, pieces that 
we would have sold to you know some of the finest museums in the country for you know ten or twenty thousand dollars or more in the 1970s today are probably worth a quarter or a third of that because nobody wants 18th century American furniture anymore. Um, the market has basically gone away. And my dad uh, loved to tell a story about um, Tiffany lamps. Um, so when he was a teenager during the depression, uh, my aunt, his sister, uh, was just starting to date. And my grandfather, who uh, in addition to being a farmer was also um, sort of a, an estate dealer. He would buy um, entire house full, people's houses. He would just buy all the furnishings and resell it as a way to make it through the depression. Um, he had bought the estate of a uh, New York state senator who lived in Albany and the contents of that house included um, a very large collection of Tiffany lamps, um, dozens of them, in fact. And uh, my grandfather brought them all home and stuffed them into their farmhouse. And my aunt uh, said to her brothers, I can't bring any boys home because of these ugly lamps. And my grandfather went on a horse buying trip out to Montana or South Dakota or something, as he did every summer. Um, and uh, he was gone for two weeks or a week or two. And finally, my aunt complained so much about the lamps that my grandmother said, it's OK. I'll take the risk. Get rid of the lamps. And so my dad and his brother, brothers, loaded up the, the farm wagon with all the Tiffany lamps and they drove to the local dump and it was a beautiful sunny day and they had a javelin contest picking up the Tiffany floor lamps and heaving them onto the top of the dump and my dad described how beautiful they were smashing in the sun all red and green and blue and yellow and, uh, you know, my grandfather came home a few days later and, you know, beat the crap out of, oh, out of all the brothers. Um, and of course, you know, my dad was telling us this story, I don't know, in the late seventies or early eighties. And, you know, today those lamps would be worth millions of dollars collectively, but in 1932 or whatever that was, they were junk. Nobody wanted them. And uh, they were such junk that my aunt couldn't bring any boyfriends into the house because they would make fun of her for having these ugly old lamps. So, you know, that's what can happen. Markets can just like disappear for generations and, um, or permanently. And uh, you can't take a liquid market for granted. You know, ask somebody who, you know, owned equities in Russia in 1913 um, or, you know, in Germany in, you know, 1938. Uh, it's, uh, that's why Graham believed in, you know, preparing for disaster and for, in, believed in the importance of protection. And, you know, if you're investing in a speculative asset class and all you're doing is projecting and you're not putting any energy into protecting, you're not asking yourself what could go wrong and what would happen to me if it does, then you're not really investing, you're speculating. It, there, was a, there was a beautiful thing I looked at in the interview that you did with Peter Bernstein all those years ago, where you asked him what the biggest mistake is that investors make. And, and he said, the, the refusal to believe that shock lies in wait. Well, that was just a lovely way to put it. Just this, this, uh, this awareness that things can happen that you could just never, you could never predict. Think of, think of, think of the pandemic shutting down everything around the world, forcing us all to, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who was visiting from South Africa the other day, and I was asking him why he didn't have any wine with his dinner. I've never seen him not drink a couple of bottles of wine at a dinner. And one of the things that had happened is I think he'd been 
in lockdown for 50 days in South Africa, and they had closed all of the off licenses. Nobody was allowed to buy any alcohol. And he'd basically gone kind of totally dry for 50 mm -hmm. days. And, and it was kind of to protect all of the hospitals, I guess, from right. car crashes and domestic abuse cases that were stirred by alcohol. You could never predict if, if you, if you were running a bar or a, a restaurant that relied on alcohol sales or an off license, it would never occur to you in a hundred years that that could happen, that the government, because of a, a pandemic that had probably come from, from China, you were going to have to close down your, your, you'd lose all liquor sales for 50 days in South Africa. Right. Right. Of course. I mean, look, I think, you know, all of us know from our own personal lives that, um, wildly unpredictable things happen all the time. And then, you know, we turn to our investment portfolios and we say, well, you know, we're in control here. And it's kind of like, no, not it. That's not the way the universe works. And uh, you just have to, you have to accept that. That's so just, if you think about the importance of, of resilience, whether you're an investor, a writer, or or anything getting getting through life. I mean, give, given given how much uncertainty and surprise there is in life, can you talk a bit about resilience, about the importance of having a thick skin, about how you develop it, about where where you get your strength that keeps you going in difficult times? Because for one thing, we we've lived through as journalists, we've gone through a period over the last thirty years where the business has been falling apart for kind of thirty years, so that's been stressful. Then you yeah. have issues with kids that you're raising. You're, you're a father of, of, of two daughters. Is, I, you're, I know that you were living with your mother-in-law, who I'm sad to say died recently. Mm -hmm. um, we're, all, we're all going through the ringer in our own special way. And I'm, I'm wondering about this question of how, how you develop that thick skin, that resilience to handle the uncertainty of, of everything that we deal with. Yeah, so I don't know. I guess I see it a little differently. So I think I I think of having a thick skin as being open to learning. And um, if I agree with you about everything, then I can't really learn from you. Um, I can it's easiest to learn from people who disagree with us. And I just don't understand the way society seems to be devolving toward the belief that everyone who disagrees with me is an idiot. Um, and anybody who thinks I'm wrong is my enemy. Um, I kind of try to regard people who think I'm wrong as my intellectual friends because they can teach me. I mean, look, if, if what they're trying to tell me is wrong, then it can't harm me. But if what they're trying to teach me is right, then that's hugely important for me to know. And uh, I guess the same kind of openness applies to adversity in, a, in an odd sort of way, which is um, it's setbacks in life or what teach us lessons and make us stronger. And if you're too afraid of that, then you can't learn from difficult experiences if, you, like, if you're trying to shut them out you have to just kind of accept them and 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 roll with the punches. You you spent a lot of time studying happiness research over the years from Kahneman and and that mm -hmm. whole crew of behavioral finance gurus. And and I'm I'm wondering if if any of the things that you've learned have have affected the way you live your life. And I remember in your money and your brain, uh, which should have been called your money and your mind. Uh, it would have been easier for some of us. <laughs> I would have remembered it better than um, in that book. Your last chapter was about happiness, right? And I, I remember you talking, uh, there was a lovely bit where you were talking about the importance of maximizing your self-worth rather than your net worth. 
Can you can you talk a little a bit about if there's anything you've really applied in your own life that's grown out of that research to to tilt the odds uh, of you having a happy life? Yeah, so um well, I wish I could say that I have a really good like work life balance, um, but I don't. Um the pandemic has really wreaked havoc with that and I'm and I'm not proud of it. I I've been working way too hard and and not playing nearly enough. Um uh, but uh yeah, I mean the 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 important principle, I think, uh to the whole question of money and happiness is um, people don't really learn from their own mistakes. So they say things like, uh, you know, I really want that new car or, you know, I really want to renovate my kitchen um, or I really want that piece of jewelry or those shoes or, the, you know, these $500 sneakers or whatever it might be, um, you know, the new Peloton bike, um, you know, possessions and material goods don't really do much for people's happiness because of adaptation. It's like as soon as as soon as we possess something and we like take it in to our daily lives, we start to get used to it, we acclimate to it, we adapt to it. And the simplest way to think about it is think about new car smell, right? Like the last time you bought a car and you got in and you smelled that new car smell, whatever that is, I don't know how the automobile scientists generate it, but it's some aroma. And you're like, ah, I love the smell of this car. And then, you know, it's gone after two weeks. And, you know, after a month or two, you know, the cat has scratched the back seat. The kids like vomited on the upholstery. There's like muffin crumbs, you know, in, in, uh, in the gear shift and coffee stains on the upholstery and there's mud on the floor and the fenders are dented and a little while later, you know, you, the mechanical problems start. And, and that's kind of the way all material, most material possessions work. Um, the way you use money to improve your happiness is, um, is through purchasing experiences, which means basically memories that you create with friends and family, um, you know, vacations, celebrations, flowers, and feasts, as Danny Kahneman likes to say, um, anything that brings people you love together. Um, because as time passes, the event actually grows in positive emotion for you when you think back on it. Um, and the other thing is uh, in making yourself a better and more well-rounded person, um, you know, taking, taking courses, um, joining, uh, volunteering for nonprofits, uh, committing to your place of worship, um, anything that puts you in a position to join with other people, doing things that help other people. Um, that can bolster your spiritual growth. Uh, so, you know, you don't just, um, you know, write a check to your favorite philanthropy, but rather you would volunteer for that philanthropy and you would, you know, wash the floors or serve the food at the benefit or whatever it might be. Something that um, commits you uh, not just with your wallet, but body and soul. When when you did a Google talk a few years ago, I remember you talking about various causes you want to support, and you were you were saying you you weren't specific about it, but you were saying, "Look, I'm investing for the next hundred years because I've got children I want to help. I've got causes I care about, um, and I want to build a long term legacy with my family's wealth." And and I was wondering when you think about. Um, the, the benefits of all of these decades of prudence and deferred gratification in your investing, you know, you've got to a point where you don't really have to work. You're so you're, you're working and saving money um, and investing it prudently for the future. What for what's um, what's the end game here? 
I mean, it's wonderful that you have this prudent deferred gratification gene that Charlie Munger talks about, but, yeah. but what, what do you think about um, what the end game is, who it can benefit? Yeah, well, so the money, uh, well, I guess some, uh, yeah, I mean, I do have causes I care about. Uh, in my case, it, you know, a lot of them are environmental. Um, and uh, there's some others as well. Um, I also want my kids to have some security. I mean, Buffett has that wonderful expression, you should give your kids enough money so that they can do anything, but not enough so they can do nothing. Um, and I think that's pretty wise. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I think for any of us, when we think about like leaving a legacy, it's usually about something we do, not something we have. And I guess, you know, if, uh, um, the, uh, the best, the best epitaph I know of, um, was actually the motto of the, um, of the great Flemish artist, Jan van Eyck, which was, um, als ich kann, which means, um, I'm loosely translating, I, I did the best I could. <laughs> which I think is wonderful. I mean, what more could you, what more could you ever ask from a person? You know, that's, uh, you know, if, if the legacy you leave is that other people would say about you, you know, he did the best he could, or she did the best she could, um, they did the best they could. That's, that's pretty good. I, I wanted to end kind of where we began with your, father. And there was a brilliant article that he wrote that you have on your website um, about the complexity of his own father, who we mentioned before, the, your uh, late grandfather, yeah. Sam, who, yeah. um, who beat everyone up over the broken Tiffany glasses. And Sam, by your father's description, was a, a very tough, illiterate, violent, rage-filled immigrant from Ukraine, who was kind of a miser, who started off working in a sweatshop in New York and then saved up to buy a farm near Albany, but your father wrote this beautiful um, obituary where he said um, he was not a kind man as kind men are known by accepted standards. He never stooped to give. Only after he died did people fully understand the essence of his charity. And they came in overwhelming numbers to say, I'm where I am today because he helped me. I thought it was a wonderful description of a, of a man with great flaws and great strengths and virtues. And I I, you, you similarly, you wrote a wonderful piece about your own father. And I'm wondering for you as someone with two daughters now in their twenties, um, how, how you'd want to be remembered by your own children. Oh boy. We were, we're really ending with, with the morbidity, aren't we? <laughs> um, well, gee, um, uh, I hope, um, I hope my kids would remember me as fair and always honest. Um, honesty is, I think, my greatest, maybe my only virtue as a parent. I think I've always been honest with my kids. Um, uh, you know, The thing, the thing that I hope I imparted to them is the importance of trying to find something you believe in and just like give it your all. And um, you know this story, William, but maybe not everybody. Uh, listening to us has, has heard this, but so when my dad was very sick, um, a couple months before he died, I came up from college to, to visit home. And um, as he always did, my, when I, not long after I got there, he asked me what I was reading because books were very important to him. 
And um, of course I was, you know, I was a college kid, so I was full of myself. And I very proudly said, uh, when he asked me what I've been reading, I said, Kierkegaard, you know, the, the Danish philosopher, who's pretty dark, by the way. Um, and my dad said, what is he telling you? And I happened to remember this beautiful line that I had just read while, while I was on the train that Kierkegaard wrote, which was, um, no individual can assist or save the age. He can only express that it is lost. And I thought this was so beautiful and sad and sort of jaundiced and, and uh, existentialist. And my dad, you know, he was in a lot of pain at that point, but he said, yeah, he's right. And he paused and he said, but that's why you have to try to save and assist the age. And I thought that was just incredible, you know, not just that my dad had out existentialized the great existentialist, but that he had put his finger on something that was incredibly profound, which is, you know, uh, life is life is hard work. And um, uh, careers are hard work, families are hard work. Um, and, you know, it's it can be very tempting to sort of give in and say, this is bigger than I am. But that feeling is part of what should keep you going. You know? Yeah, and, and I, I think you sort of resisted at the start of the conversation when I was saying that you, you to some degree, had inherited your father's crusading quality as a journalist. I, I do think... I do think there's an element in what you've done over the last 30, 40 years as a journalist where you are saving and assisting the world. And there's, I remember once you gave a speech where you picked up some award and you were, you were saying, look, we are sometimes kind of embarrassed about what we do writing about money, but actually money is hugely important. And I, I think Peter Bernstein had said that if you want to really know about someone, look at how they deal with money, that it's, yeah. it's so central to our lives, the way the way we invest, the way we save, the way we spend our money, um, the way we share our money, all of those things. And, and I think there's deep honor actually in the sort of service journalism that protects people from getting taken advantage of, but to protects them from their own stupidity and bias and ignorance and emotion and, and kind of arms them to, 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 to make better decisions and to, to take care of their families and the like. So I, 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 I feel like um, you, you may be wary of giving yourself credit for this, but I, I, I feel like you've done a, a, a great service in continuing that tradition. Well, thank you, William. Although, uh, aside from embarrassing me, you're also making me feel old. Uh, but <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's like Al Siak Khan. I mean, you know, you just do the best you can. Um, and um, you know, I, I just place a lot of store in what Jim Michaels said that we talked about at the beginning that, you know, you don't want to get anybody's blood on your hands. And that's kind of, you know, that's a pretty good guide. And, you know, I often tell fund managers that uh, they would be better off if their firms always asked, um, you know, should we, would we want our mothers to invest in this? You know, it's like, you know, out, out South and in the West, you'll often see this bumper sticker on cars, you know, WWJD, like what would Jesus do? And I'd like to see a bumper sticker, WWMB, what would mom buy? You know, and, you know, if you're designing some investment product that, you wouldn't be proud to have your mom own. Maybe you should like bury that out back and, you know, not try to sell it to the public because if it isn't good enough for your mom, it isn't good enough for anybody else either. And I, I think that's one reason why we revere Buffett and Munger is that they're not just great at making money. They've done it in a pretty honorable way, treating, treating their shareholders as, as partners. And yeah, 
and transparent and admitting their mistakes. So, so yeah, I, I think the, the manner of the victory matters as well. Absolutely. I think that's really, I think that's really important. Is there anything else you'd like to add before I let you go? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we covered a ton of, a ton of ground and, um, you know, as long as, as long as we fully disclose to people that we've been friends for a very long time. So. <laughs> and hopefully that survived this interview. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Well, I, I'd like to thank you, Jason, for, for being a, a, a great ally and supporter and, and truth teller and role model over the years. And thank you to our listeners for being here with us. I, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, thank my you. pleasure, William. Always great to be with you. Uh, it's a real delight. Thank you, Jason. All righty. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.